Good morning, everyone. Magandang umaga. Magandang umaga. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, magandang umaga is just simply saying good morning. So I'm kind of teaching you a little bit of Filipino today. So, magandang umaga. Magandang umaga. Good job, kids. <laughs> again, let's do it again. Magandang umaga. Awesome. Magandang umaga. Magandang umaga. Magandang umaga. Watermelon, watermelon. I heard it. <laughs> Magandang umaga. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So raise your hand if you were from your Sunday school. Sunday school. Good job. Raise your hand if you don't have a Sunday school yet. That's okay. That's a good news because there's a lot, a ton of Sunday school classes that would cater your need and you know you can, you know, vibe with them. So I am personally I am in Miss Gina's class, the um, women's Sunday school class every Sunday morning. And then raise your hand if you are in Wednesday or Sunday um, evening discipleship class. Woohoo! Awesome. All right, good job, guys, for joining in that specific um, classes because that will absolutely help us grow more together, right? As a family, as a church, and individually as Christians. So how about let's all stand up and let's sing Life Song.
Cheers. Good morning. Are you guys ready for the memory verse? Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, let's do this together. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. That was good. All right, let's do it one more time. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. Good job. That was really good. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for letting us gather in your presence in this building, in this town, in this nation, Lord. Please open up our hearts, open up our minds to hear your word today, to worship you, Lord. As we're worshiping you, Lord, receive it. Receive our worship. Receive our hearts. And let us, as we leave today, let us take you and your word into the world around us, to the people around us that need to hear you. And I pray this in your holy, perfect, and precious name. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much, Lord. Lord, just speak to our hearts this morning. Show us what you want to show us. Open our hearts to hear your words, Lord, in song and in scripture. And just speak to us in Jesus' name. Giants come calling my name My God is so much bigger Than the troubles I face Why would I hunger For power or riches or fame My God is so much better all of these things and I won't be shaken I won't be moved my God is faithful His promise is true so I speak to the mountains oh it's time to move
much bigger than the troubles I face. Take this offering that I bring.
worshiping you, bowing down in spirit and truth, with lifted hands, worshiping Yes, Jesus. Yes, King Jesus. Our Master, our Lord, our Savior. Lord, we thank you for this moment that we can just worship you, God. That we can just adore you. That we can just exalt your name. Lord, thank you for saving our lives, Lord. Thank you for loving us and thank you for the abundance of your love and grace for us. And Lord, here we are freely, freely worshiping you. And Lord, if there is one, two, or three, or more than that here in this room right now who needs to experience the goodness of Jesus and who needs to receive him, as their Lord, their Master, their Savior, I pray like, right now that you will move them, speak to them clearly. And as we continue to worship you, God, by soaking in, in your word, listening to you through Pastor Mike, we pray that our hearts are ready to receive what you have for us this morning we worship you Jesus this we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus amen 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 be seated if you would thank you Stephanie and praise team it is so good to worship with you this morning thank you for being here thank you for making worship a priority thank you for being here take your Bibles if you would open them up to the book of Colossians Colossians chapter 1, please. Colossians chapter 1, as we continue our series in the book of Colossians. I'll tell you a quick story I, I uh, didn't share with the first service. Man, I struggled with this message, and I struggled with this message, and I struggled with this message. Austin Cannon came by my office about 5.20, 5.25 on Thursday, somewhere through there. And uh, he says, is there anything you need before I leave? And I said, man, pray that this blockage gets removed because I'm stuck. And it's Thursday. And Friday I'm swamped. And Saturday I'm swamped. And Sunday's coming. Ah! Put yourself in a preacher's shoes. It's no fun. And then Darren Spangle, he, he stopped by about 6.20 and... He's been dealing with some medical issues and stuff, but he's back up on top now. He's doing so much better. Praise God for that. And he stopped by about 6.20, and he said, Pastor, I was driving by, and I saw your, 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 your truck here, and I wanted to stop, see if you needed anything, anything I can do for you. And I said, man, I don't need a thing other than for you to pray that I would get unstuck because I am stuck. I, I, have you ever been stuck? I, I was stuck. He walked out. He says, he said, Pastor, I got you. And he walked out and he, he, uh, he, he left. And I mean, not five minutes later, the floodgates opened. And within 20 minutes, what you're about to get was typed up. And wow, glory to God. So, if, if, you, if you haven't been praying for your pastor, would you pray for your pastor, please? I don't want to wait till Thursday again to get a message. That's no fun. Um, kick up the prayers a little bit for me. I, uh, uh, uh. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 is where we're going to be. I'm going to give you a, a somewhat of a thesis statement. Now, it's not a perfect thesis statement for English teachers in the crowd. Miss Katie, don't judge me. Don't degrade me. Um, but this is a close. This is close. Um, to This thesis statement for the message, to walk in kingdom power. We need to begin to embrace the principles of this passage. To walk in kingdom power. We've been talking about kingdom power all year long, right? So to walk in kingdom power, 
we will need to embrace, begin, begin to embrace. It's at the beginning, the word begin is key, all right? Begin to embrace. We need to begin to embrace the principles that's laid for us by the Holy, through the Holy Spirit, by the Apostle Paul, as he, as he lays out these, these verses for us. So I'm going to give you three things that we're going to look at. I'm going to give it to you right now up front. Thing one, in this text that we're about to read, there is a level of biblical expectation that you and I will suffer for the gospel. The second thing we're going to get from, see from this text is the church is vitally important in the life of every follower of Christ. Vitally important for every follower of Christ. The third thing that we're going to look at is that you and I are to make the gospel of Jesus Christ known. And then he wraps all that up in a very neat sentence in verse 29, but we're not going to go there yet. If you've got Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, say, I got it. Good job. Gave you plenty of time. Here we go. Now, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery. He uses this word twice in this passage. The first one is right here, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's People. In other words, look right here for just a second. Don't not read your pastor. It's not polite. What he is saying is if you are a follower of Christ, the veil, if you would, has been removed so that you have full understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you are still, if you're here today or you're watching online and you go, I don't understand the gospel, I don't get it yet. Pause even right now, right now, right where you sit. You don't even have to close your eyes. Just keep your eyes open and just simply say, say this to God. God, would you give me understanding of the gospel? That's all you got to say. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it in your mind. God, give me understanding of your gospel. Because it's only when God touches you, the Holy Spirit draws you to the Father, that you have understanding of of the gospel, and that you can become a follower of Christ. And that's what he's saying right here. But it's now disclosed to the Lord's people. It's been unveiled. The mystery has been made known. Verse 27, to them God has chosen. Hallelujah. Woo, this is so good. <laughs> to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. There's that word again. Of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory or the hope of heaven or the promise of heaven, the assurance of glory, the assurance of heaven. Verse 28, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend. Oh, I love verse 29. I may need to make it a, a, mem a memory verse. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Whew, what a passage. Now, before we pray, before we pray, I want, I want you... Hmm. Before we pray, I want you to ask yourself this question. Which of these three principles do you need to wrap your head around the most? The principle of suffering for the gospel? 
the principle that the church is extremely valuable in the, in the life of the follower of Christ, or the principle that says we are to proclaim the gospel. Which of these principles do you need to wrap your head around the most? Do you need to invite into your life? Now, as soon as you got one of those, what, your, yours picked out, raise your hand. Leave your hand up for just a second. Yeah, I'm putting you on the spot, aren't I? I know. I know. Got one? Repeat them? Thank you. Principle one, suffering for the gospel. Do I need to wrap my head around suffering for the gospel? Principle two, the value of the church. That the church is extremely valuable to the follower of Christ. Principle three, that I, you, need to begin proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which one of those three principles do you need to own walking out of here? Now, raise your hand if you got it. Raise your hand if you got it. One more time. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you got it. Awesome. All right. Father in heaven, we acknowledge, we acknowledge before you that each of us needs one of these. So, Father, by the power of your Spirit, whew, God, make it clear. Make it clear, the mystery of Christ. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. These three principles. Principle number one is there, there is a biblical level of expectation that you and I will suffer for the gospel. And I want you to notice this principle does not say you might or you can or you should. But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you will suffer for the gospel. That's a principle that is seen in scriptures. If, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, there is a level of expectation that you will suffer for the gospel. Now, I have been letting you guys off the hook a lot the last several weeks. I haven't asked you to turn to a lot of scriptures. That changes this morning for just a message anyway, all right? Go with me to two places. Place one, Acts chapter 20. If you need the concordance, it's in the front of your Bible. It'll show you exactly where the book of Acts is. Both of these are in the New Testament. Acts chapter 20. And the second one is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Acts 20 and 2 Corinthians 11. One more time, Acts 20, 2 Corinthians 11. If you've got Acts 20, say, I got it. Acts 20, I want you to scroll down, if you would, to verse 24. Now, this is, God gave this verse to me many years ago as my life verse. My life verse. You say, well, what's a life verse? A life verse is something that the Spirit of God gives you as he, opens up his, as he opens up the Bible because he wants you to own this verse. He wants you to live this out. Like the song we sang earlier, let my life song sing to you. If I could, if I could put this into a song, verse 24, it would be my song that I would sing to the Father every day. Verse 24, the Apostle Paul says, however... I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now, the Apostle Paul here is not suffering from depression. The Apostle Paul is not suffering with an identity crisis. The Apostle Paul is saying, gang, in comparison to the gospel, my life is worth zero. My purpose, Paul is saying, my purpose is to finish my life, to finish my race, to continue to stay focused. So if you can imagine yourself going around a track you're going around a track, you're going around a track, you're going around a track. Loopity, loopity, loop, right? This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Man, I'm going to stay on track. I'm going to finish my course, complete this, because Jesus has called me 
to live this out. Live what out? The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And the Apostle Paul says, in comparison to the calling that Jesus has given me, my life is worth nothing. Remember the first principle. There is a level of expectation that you and I will suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It's just a couple of, well, it's a couple of books to your right. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I would like it if you would please scroll down to verse 22. We're going to pick up in mid-thought with the Apostle Paul, but that's okay because time's sake, it's just, it's just what's needed. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22. As soon as you got it, say, I got it. Wow, you guys are so good. Here we go. Thank you. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? And Paul says, I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. You say, why would he say that? Because he's he's speaking out of humility, but he's speaking out of boldness at the same time. And so he's like, you guys need to hear this. Man, I'm normally more humble than this, but listen to me. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently. Now look right up here at me. I want to hear. I want to see a show of hands. Has anyone in the room ever been in prison? Not not in prison in general. Have you ever been in prison for the gospel? Raise your hand. Awesome. Praise God. Hallelujah, sister. That's beautiful. Wow. Stay after church. I want to talk to you. Seriously. That is so cool. It's rare in America that we will see people who have the privilege of being imprisoned for the gospel. Even for a short time. Paul says, I've been in prison more frequently. Do you realize, hey, what, 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 no, stop, don't, don't read, out, read your pastor. Do you realize in some third world countries, going to prison for the gospel is actually like being seminary trained? They view going to prison like going to seminary. It's, it's, a, it's, it's like you, you've hit a benchmark in following Christ. That's in third world countries today in the year 2023. My friends, when I say there's a level of expectation for suffering for the gospel, I mean, I'm serious. And maybe, just maybe, if we're not suffering for the gospel, we're just not doing it right. We're not living our life right. What follow? Now follow. He says, I've been in prison more frequently, I've been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again. And again, and then he says this, verse 24, five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. You guys see what I'm holding here? This is called a flagrum. This is what they flog people with. Now, because you guys are right here on the front row, feel, feel that. And then hand it down. So you can, and if you want to touch the barbs, you can. Just do so gently and hand it on down. He says, five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Five times. Now, if you... Mr. Lackey, you're one of the smartest men in the room. What, what is five times 39. See, I love people like you. And what was the number? 195? Say it again. 195, Don Johnson. 195, five times 39. That's how many times the Apostle Paul would have gotten hit Brian's got his, his calculator out. I know he does. <laughs> he received this on his back. And this is not by 
some kindergartner or first grader. This is by full-grown men who were trained in how to make those points, the points right there at the very tip, dig into a person's back and pull it at just the right time so that they would feel the most punishment. <laughs> yeah. The strong man goes, whoa. <laughs> That's what Paul went through. And he's not the only one. There were Christians upon Christians upon Christians that went through that. Oh, it's, 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 no, it's, it's terrible. It is awful. But, but I actually had a friend give this to me um, several years ago. His name is Colby King. Some of you know Colby. The barbs would have been sharper, but this is a replica of what would have been used and by the way, our Lord also suffered the same, being beaten before he carried his cross, before his death. The Apostle Paul says, I have been five times, I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Now, let that soak in. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times, and this is all for the gospel. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I mean, my skin gets shriveled after 10 minutes in a bathtub. Come on. A night and a day in the open sea with, you, you, you feel like you're going to die? I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. One of the principles that Paul is laying before us here when he says, Now I rejoice that I am suffering for you, the church. And what we see in the entire New Testament is a level of expectation that you and I will suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 11, we're not going to turn there, but Hebrews chapter 11, especially toward the end, it's, it's known as the faith chapter, but toward the end of Hebrews 11, it talks about how Christians were torn in two. They were stretched and torn in two. They were sawed in half. All of this because of the gospel. All but one of Jesus' apostles, one of his twelve, all but one of the twelve, uh, only one, I should say, only one died a natural death. It's recorded, it's reported in church tradition that the apostle John, the one Jesus loved as it's known in, in the Gospels, died a natural death. All the others died a violent death due to the Gospel. And John, it's reported, it's reported, not in Scripture, but in church tradition that's handed down in extra biblical material, that John was actually thrown into a boiling oil and came out alive. And he ended up dying a natural death. I could tell you story after story after story. And if you've never studied this, I would encourage you to study it. You say, why? That's very depressing. Why would I want to study about Christians dying? My friends, it builds our faith. We study about Christians being, Christians suffering for the gospel. It builds our faith. There's a book called, it's a small book, 
I like small books. It's a small book. It's called Praying with the Anabaptist. And this Praying with the Anabaptist book goes back and it tells the stories of some of the Christians, some of the followers of Christ that were tortured and burned like tiki torches, if you would, set on fire, hung by a stake, and then set on fire and burned. This increases our faith. Many followers of Christ have died. The book of Revelation tells about how Christians will be dying. Living a life of faith. My friends, there is a level of expectation that you and I will suffer for our faith. And if we're not suffering, we might need to ask the Father, are we living our Christian life in a wrong way? You don't have to turn there, but I'd love it if you'd write it down. It's 2 Corinthians 4.16. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this, in spite of suffering, you might in, in spite of suffering, you might be experiencing. When we stay close to the Father, we will be renewed day after day. Did you hear that? I'm going to repeat that. 2 Corinthians 4.16, in spite of suffering, we, you might be experiencing, we stay close to the Father. When we stay close to the Father, we will be renewed day after day after day. Amen? The first principle, you and I need to ask the Father, is suffering something that is expected from my life? And if so, how? Do I embrace it and live it out for your glory? The second principle that we're going to examine is the importance of the church. Look with me at Colossians 1, verse 25. Colossians 1, 25 and 26. It reads this. I have become its servant, the servant of the gospel. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Now, he's talking to the church. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. Look at verse 28. He is the one, Christ Jesus is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. My friends, the church is where people are made complete. The church family is where people are made full. The church family, by attending church, by attending Sunday school, by attending discipleship classes, by walking with other Christians, this is where we are discipled. If you're attending First Baptist Church Aztec and you're not growing in completeness, you're not growing in your spiritual fullness, you're not growing in your discipleship, I'm going to lay before you, you are doing it wrong. Because there are ample opportunities for you to grow. There are ample opportunities for you to get full spiritually. There are ample opportunities for you to grow in completeness. Beginning with Sunday school classes. People in your Sunday school classes are not perfect. Amen? There you go. Good job. Because I'm not perfect and you're not perfect. There's no one perfect. But in your Sunday school classes, what you will find is people who are struggling with some of the same things you're struggling with, and you can walk alongside them, and both of you grow together. We've got a class being offered uh, that's coming up. It's called Experiencing God. Iola is going to be teaching Experiencing God. Matter of fact, the sign-up sheet is right out there in the hallway. You want to grow? Take classes like Experiencing God. Take classes like Financial Peace University. By the way, Financial Peace University is not only about getting out of debt, but how you can live in such a way that money is not a God. You'll learn that in Financial Peace University. And yes, you will get out of debt. We got a spiritual gifts class that's being offered, an iron sharpening iron class, a men's Bible study class that's offered every Wednesday night, women's classes that are offered. 
Yesterday, there was a men's Bible study and a ladies' Bible study back-to-back. It's the third Saturday of every month. We have something called COPS prayer time that happens during the week. we got Tuesday time of prayer. And by the way, on the Tuesday time of prayer, if you look at your life and you go, man, I just don't know how to pray, would you get a hold of someone within the church? Someone that you feel like knows how to pray? And say, meet me at church on Tuesday. And the two of you pray aloud together. And learn from someone how to pray. The only reason you don't know how to pray is because, my opinion, you're not praying. But if you're uncomfortable with that, get with someone. And the Tuesday time of prayer is a beautiful time to do that. There are opportunities for spiritual growth for children, for students, for preschoolers, for babies. And the list goes on and on and on. Like Phil Sylvia, who was here talking about the the archaeological digs that support the scriptures as they discover more and more. We have Master's Voice that come in, talking about discipleship and growing. Uh, Danny Lynchard is going to return with us and be with us October 1st through the 4th. October 1, 2, 3, and 4. All of these, and there's so many more, ways to grow spiritually. The Apostle Paul says we need to be growing in fullness. We need to be learning how to proclaim, admonish, and teach everyone with all wisdom so that everyone is presented to Christ being fully mature. It is on you to pull yourself up to a table and eat. There are many tables being offered for your continued growth and fullness. The third principle, there's so much more that can be said about the church. We're moving on. The third principle, you and I are to make known the gospel. You and I are to make known the gospel. Look at verse 27. To them, that is the Christians, the followers of Christ, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What Paul is saying is Christians have been given the responsibility to make known to Gentiles or the people of the world the truth of Christ. This is not just being nice. You're nice because you're supposed to be nice, right? That's that's why we're nice. That's not sharing the gospel. Being nice is not sharing the gospel. Praying with people is not sharing the gospel. It is something we're supposed to do. Let me give you a quick story. This This last week, it was just this last week, and I don't remember what day it was, it was just this last week, I was walking into Safeway, and I think I was going to the sushi And I was cutting in front of the registers, and I saw two women at a register, and one is a church member, and she hadn't been to church since COVID became cool. And she was checking out, and I stopped and said, hey, been missing you, how you doing? And we, we, we talked, we visited, and she caught me up on life, and her mom was there with her, and her mom says, hey, I got these issues that I'm struggling with, and she broke them down for me. And as soon as they finished with the the cash register person and their groceries were bagged, I said, can I pray with you? And they looked around and said, right here? Yes, right here. And so we put our hands on each other's shoulders and we prayed right there in front of the Safeway bags that God would move greatly in their life. You go, that's not sharing the gospel? No, that's not sharing the gospel. That's doing what every Christian is supposed to be doing, to be out ministering to people, loving on people, being Jesus to people, being the hands and feet of Christ. That's just, that's just what we're supposed to be doing. That's not sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel is making known that Christ lives in us. It's literally opening your mouth and making the words come out, Christ lives in me, I want him to live in you. 
It's you and I opening our mouth and saying, in Christ is the power to remove sin. In Christ is the power for you to receive forgiveness. In Christ is the power for you to go to heaven. That's what that means. And by the way, we can share the gospel and not be mean to people. That's a good point for an amen. I can do both sides of this if you need me to. I can preach an amen. It's just awkward. Preaching the gospel is not where we go up and hit people upside the head with our Bible. That's not it either. Sharing the gospel is you and I sitting down with someone, maybe over a chicken fried steak. It's almost lunchtime. I'm hungry. Or some enchiladas, praise God. Or a cup of coffee. Or even under a shade tree. And we say something, can I pick on you? And we say something like this. Now, I know you're already a follower of Christ, but we're just going to play. We're standing under a shade tree. And I say, Richard, you know I love you, right? Yeah. There was a point that I asked Jesus to come into my life and to save me from going to hell, to forgive me of my sins. And to be the king, the boss, the Lord of my life. And I love you so much that I want you to go to heaven with me. Would you be interested in asking Jesus to save you, to turn away from your sins, and ask him to be the boss of your life? Now, I know Richard's already done that. But that's all that it is, as hard as it is. It's, it's you and I loving people enough to share Jesus with them. It's you and I loving people enough to stand side by side and say, I don't want to go to heaven without you. Can I share with you how to go to heaven? And it's, it's them then taking the step because the Holy Spirit is drawing them or the Holy Spirit is not drawing them. If they look at you and they say, no, I'm not interested in that, who are they rejecting? Yes, exactly. God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, fill in the blank. Safe Sunday school answer. That's it. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Holy Spirit who has given them an opportunity. They're expecting, they're rejecting the blood of Christ. They're rejecting the love of the Father. You and I. have a responsibility as it says in verse 27 to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery which is Christ in you the hope of glory or the hope of heaven you and I are to make known to this world the mystery of Christ, which is that God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, die, but they will have eternal life. Because God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. In just a moment, we're going to look at a video. We're going to watch a video in just a moment. We're going to watch a video that's called, that's titled The Four Chaplains, and it's a story about four chaplains in World War II who I believe lived out the principles that we see here. But before we get to that, look at verse 29 with me. Verse 29. To this end, to what end? To the end of reaching people with the gospel and discipling them, making them, being able to present them fully mature in Christ to this end, I strenuously contend. In other words, with all my power that I can, I contend. I do this. I strenuously contend. I strain as I contend. I strain as I work with what? With all the energy Christ so powerfully works in 
me. That's through the Holy Spirit. It's through the Holy Spirit of God who lives in every follower of Christ. He says, I strain, I do my part. We're not passive. We do our part, and then God does his part through us. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. My friends, that is unlimited power that lives in you. That is unlimited energy that lives in you. That is unlimited potential that lives in you. Look at the person next to you and say, you have unlimited potential. Do that right now. In Christ, you have unlimited potential to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because the Spirit is working in you and wants to flow through you. And just maybe the reason... We aren't suffering for the gospel. Is because we're not sharing the gospel. Maybe the reason some Christians don't see the vital importance of the church is because they're not willing to suffer for the gospel. I'm just saying maybe something to chew on. In this video, The Four Chaplains, it's a true story. It's a real story that you're about to see lived out on video. Daniel, would you play that for us, please? The Dorchester was docked there in New York City. The chaplains joined the throngs of men that were gathering on board the ship. There were four chaplains. One was a Roman Catholic priest named John Washington. Another was a Jewish rabbi named Alexander Good. There was two Protestants, Chaplain Poling and Chaplain Fox. They were all lieutenants. They had all gone to chaplain school. And the four of them found that they all had so much in common. They thought in terms of humanity and not just in terms of their own individual community. That you had four chaplains who were of differing religious backgrounds and different faith groups were able to put aside those differences was really a testimony to their understanding that in order to be victorious, we had to work together. A lesson the chaplains would teach every day with every breath. A lesson that would prove vital when the ship and its young soldiers sailed into deadly waters and into the crosshairs of a Nazi wolf pack. After the Dorchester left uh, St. John's and went into the open sea, the Germans got word that the convoy was heading toward Greenland. The Dorchester was now on a collision course with the enemy. Fear would stalk the decks. Its primary antidote, faith, and the four chaplains who understood its power. On February 3rd, 1943, at one o'clock in the morning, we heard this tremendous explosion. We were hit by a torpedo. The torpedo hit into the right side of the ship. Everything went black. All lights disappeared. And of course, everybody running like lunatics. It was every man for himself. People were frantic. People who didn't forgot their life preservers. People who didn't have clothes on. Some of them were crying. They were just caught completely surprised, and they didn't know what to do. The chaplains made their way to the top deck, doing everything that they could to try to give soldiers some direction in order to save as many lives as they possibly could. The four chaplains took off their life preservers and gave it to men who didn't have a life preserver on. And they gave it to them so that they could possibly survive this ordeal. The ship was about to go down, but the chaplains were about to lift their men to new heights. The four would come together to shine a beacon of hope in the ship's darkest hour. That's when I saw these four men standing 
arm in arm on the top of the boat. The chaplains locked arms and prayed together. They linked arms, and then they joined in singing hymns, each of them in a different language. One was Latin, one was Hebrew, another was English, and they were humming these songs uh, while the ship went down. To see them in that disheveled moment of disaster all around them, and yet this inner calm in these four men as they ministered to the people around them was, as one man said, as close to heaven as I ever hoped to be. Even gave up their life preservers so that others could live. For me, I don't know about you, but for me, that video recaps the three principles that are here. The principle of suffering, the principle of, of believing the importance of, of your cause, which is the church, and the principle of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. These chaplains were trying to bring encouragement to the men. And I, man, I can't help but wonder how many men, how many, how many men turned from their sins as the ship was sinking that day. These chaplains were seeing the bigger picture, the bigger picture of living and dying in the midst of battle. Christians, followers of Christ, can we see a bigger picture in the midst of the battle? Can we see a bigger picture? A bigger picture that suffering for the gospel is okay? I'm not saying to throw yourself in front of a truck to suffer for the gospel. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying take, the, take these principles and put them to work and see if the Spirit will allow you the privilege of suffering for the gospel. Today, ask the Father to allow you to see where the comfort zone you are in has robbed you of suffering for the gospel. Ask the Father to show you the value of His church. And, and ask Him, am I investing, God, am I investing my, into the life of your church, my time, my talents, and my tithe? Am I doing this? Ask the Father if you're serving in His strength. Or are you serving in your own strength, your own power, your own energy? But if we serve in His, we have unlimited power, energy, and potential. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Today, right where you sit, with... Would you pray and ask Christ to come into your life? Would you surrender your life to Him? Asking Him to be in control and not you. Asking Him to save your soul from going to hell. Asking Him to forgive you. And asking Him to be the King, the Lord, the boss of your life. If you've already done that, you've already established that between you and God, then Christians, would you ask God to reveal to you that comfort zone in your life and lead you to remove it? That comfort zone that's robbing you from some joy, some joy of suffering for the blood of Christ? If you're here today and you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you come here. The church is not perfect, but we love Jesus and we're pursuing Him with all we have. Come plant yourself in the soil of First Baptist Church Aztec and grow alongside us. I'm gonna have some friends on my right, I'm gonna have some friends on my left. They're ready to receive you as, as I am right here in the middle. When we're through praying, I'm gonna ask you to come publicly to pray with us Maybe pray at this altar, but to come and do business with God. Father in heaven, as we respond to you without shame and without fear, be glorified by our lives. 
be praised by our life. Some coming to receive Jesus, to surrender their life to Him, to be forgiven. Others, oh Lord God, asking you to reveal that comfort zone. They can step out and begin living for you in a brand new way. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? And as you stand, would you come? As you stand, would you come? In Jesus' name, come quickly. Father right now from the message that you just heard through the scriptures what what do you need to say to the Father would you speak that to him right now just you and God would you speak that to him whatever it is
Father, you are an amazing, amazing God. You're so good. You're so kind. You are so loving. Father, there is nothing you have held back from us. God, may we be joyous in our salvation, not mad about it, happy. And may we, with that joy and love, share the truth about Christ with others. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you be seated and watch these video announcements with me, please? Good morning, friends. Thank you for making worship a priority in your life. I hope you've enjoyed your worship experience with us this morning. My name is Jarrell, and it is my pleasure to share with you a few things I think you may want to take part in. This Tuesday from 5.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., our worship center will be open for you and others in the community to come and pray and seek the face of God. Make plans to come and join us. Nothing is impossible with God. The August baptism celebration will be on Sunday, August 27th at 4.30 p.m. Immediately following the baptisms, we will have a party in the fellowship hall. Cake and other goodies will be served. Be present to encourage those that are following Christ in baptism. If you wish to get baptized, please make an appointment with Pastor Mike. Several discipleship groups will be starting in the coming weeks. Sharda Sanders will start a new session of Grief Share on Sunday, August 27th at 5.30 p.m. On Wednesday, August 30th, Iola Parks will be leading a group on Experiencing God, and Ida Velasquez will be leading a group on the Spirit and His Gifts. Don Johnson will be starting a new session of Financial Peace University on Sunday, September 10th at 5.30 p.m. You may sign up for these groups on the sign-up board. I'm so glad you decided to spend your Sunday morning with us. We believe First Baptist Aztec is a place for you to find hope, healing, and a church to call home. If this is your first time here, Pastor Mike would like to meet with you outside the north doorway where you will receive your favorite soda candy bar and a gift thanks again for worshiping the lord with us today and guest welcome home that's right welcome home we're so glad you're here and we hope you find first baptist church aztec as a place that you can call home um, thank you for worshiping with us again thank you for being here and honoring us with that classes are we have some classes tonight other classes are starting up soon you'll see the sign up sheets on the board other side of that baptistry you'll see a big big board that says sign up don't just take a moment and stop by that. Introduce to you a friend of mine. I think I can call you my friend. Come on up, Jason. This is Jason. Jason's the good looking one. He's in, be he's in between John and I, all right? So, <laughs> uh, Jason has asked just, just moments ago, just moments ago, Jason asked Jesus to come into his life and save him and to be the boss of his life. Um, he'll be, he will be baptized soon, and uh, I'm excited for him and for your family, my friend, and uh, I'm proud of you. I am. We're going to pray for you here in just a moment. Uh, thank you. Some of you have already tithed online. You've already placed your offering and tithes in the, in the offering boxes. Great job. If you haven't, don't forget to do that as you leave, uh, but make sure you do that as an act of worship, all right? That's just a way, an expression of our worship and our love for God, and, um, and it's not about money. It's about our heart. And so just keep that in mind as, as we're obedient to the Father. Guess I'm going to be right outside those doors. Come see me in just a moment. Would you stand with me, please? If you want to check out this flag room and you promise to be super duper, uber, uber careful, I'm going to leave it right here.
all right? Uh, but be careful. Um, I, I don't want anyone to get hurt. I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want me to get hurt if I'm close by, all right? So maybe it's selfish on my part. Be careful. It's laying right there. Father in heaven, God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the principles that we've seen from your word this morning. God, help us to take and apply and live it out. And Lord, we lift up to you, Jason. Uh, as a church family, God, we lift him up before you. God, we thank you for bringing him here to First Baptist Church Aztec. We thank you for his family. We thank you for saving his soul. And Father, we ask right now that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit. Father, corporately together, we lift him up and ask that you would fill Jason with your Holy Spirit. God, from the soles of his feet to the top of his head, you would consume him with your love and with your power. And that from this moment on, he, he is a different man because he has surrendered to you. God, fill him with your spirit. A spirit of fear is not of you. A spirit of love and a spirit of power and a spirit of self-discipline, that is of you. That's what your word tells us. So we rebuke the fear, O oh Lord God. We ask, him to, ask you to fill him with your love, with your power, and with your self-control, your self-discipline. God, fill him with you. Fill him with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you guys. See some of you tonight. Guests, come see me um, at those doors right there.